right? Lenin was the leader of the Bolshevik party, um, founder of the Soviet Union. He's in a mausoleum in Red Square in Moscow. That's Vladimir Lenin. And v Vladimir Lenin became an iconic saint after his death. He was put in a mausoleum and his body was preserved. Um, his picture was put up everywhere across the Soviet Union. The Soviet Communist Party actually stated that its official ideology was Marxism-Leninism. Um, and Lenin became an icon. And if you read some of the official histories, if you read the Com History of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, Short Course, which is a very good book, it's like the official Soviet textbook on the history of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, very good book, Short Course, History of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, Short Course, very good, very informative book. Um, if you read some of the other books that have been published, Trotsky does this too, if you read Trotsky's writings on this, you get the idea that, that it was a cult, that Lenin was the great leader, and that Lenin, you know, Lenin, you know, you get this image of this strong, amazing, charismatic man that everyone bowed before, and he was amazing, and all of that, and Lenin was not that. The more you read about who Vladimir Lenin was, you get a very, very different picture. Very, very different picture of who Vlad... The more you learn about who Vladimir Lenin really was, the more you understand that that, that patron saintage, that cult of personality that was built around Lenin, mainly after the, he died, that that is a misrepresentation uh, of, of who he was. Um, Vladimir Lenin, um, he had a, first of all, he had a speech impediment, right? He, he, he had a lisp, basically. He had difficulty speaking, an extreme amount of difficulty speaking, and he was quite shy. He was quite shy. He had difficulty speaking. Uh, he was shy, um, but he was very, very worked up, and he was very, very obsessive. Um, and probably the event that had the biggest impact on Vladimir Lenin's life was the fact that his older brother was executed. Vladimir Lenin's older brother received the death penalty. I believe Vladimir Lenin was a teenager at the time, if I'm not mistaken. His older brother was a university student, and his older brother had joined the terrorists, which was not a slur. It's what this group in Russia called themselves. There were some revolutionaries in Russia uh, who called themselves the terrorists. Um, and the terrorists uh, had attempted to assassinate uh, one of the czars. I think it was Tsar Alexander III. Um, and Lenin's older brother had tried to kill one of the czars and failed and been caught, and so he was hanged. And so Lenin's older brother got the death penalty. Now, if, if you can imagine the amount of trauma you know, you're 14, 15 years old, and your older brother, your older brother gets executed. You want to talk about a, an event in your life that is going to be pivotal. I mean, that is huge. Your family dies, someone in your immediate family, one of your siblings, one of your parents die. Always, always a traumatic experience. But to have that member of your family charged with a crime by the government and formally executed, um, you know, that is, that has got to be a, a, a horrific, horrific, traumatizing experience, right? And to think that that didn't have an impact on Vladimir Lenin and the course of his life would be an illusion, right? To have your older brother executed uh, is huge. Now, you know, the fact that Lenin was rather shy in his personal interaction, that he had the lisp, uh, he was kind of soft-spoken, at the same time that he was shy and somewhat soft-spoken, Vladimir Lenin was also obsessed. He was obsessed, right? There was one of his critics uh, who was arguing against him, and he said, how am I supposed to argue with somebody who lives and breathes revolution 24 hours a day? He was obsessed. He thought about nothing but communism, nothing but revolution. He was obsessed. And when there would be a crisis in the political groups he was working in, he would start to have heart trouble. 
he would be unable to sleep. He would have a, a nervous condition where he was just on edge and couldn't focus on anything. Um, he, he, he suffered of this, you know, this condition of this chronic stress. He would stress himself out. And in order to calm himself down, he would get so worked up over political divisions and such, uh, he, would, he learned to play the piano. Playing the piano was how he calmed himself down. He played the piano. So when you think of Vladimir Lenin, think of a guy with a lisp who's shy, who gets really worked up over political debates, and in order to calm himself down, he forces himself to develop, you know, a hobby, black hammer, to develop a hobby, and that hobby is playing the piano. That's Vladimir Lenin, right? Not the image that you get. That's not, you know, you watch these Sergei Eisenstein films, you know, it's not what you think it is. Now, he was a very good writer, um, and he forced himself to become a good speaker, despite this fel the fact that he was shy. But ultimately, and this is the important thing, what made Vladimir Lenin effective was not his ability to rally the masses. It was his ability to kind of corral and regroup the revolutionary movement. And again, doesn't fit the image. We see those images of Lenin speaking and it's at a podium. A lot of times those are clips from a Sergei Eisenstein film called October. They're not actually clips of Lenin, but regardless, you know, you know, the fact that Lenin became what he became was because Lenin built the Bolshevik party. He built, he built the Bolshevik party and the Bolsheviks really were a party. It was a party of new type and it was a party, uh, it was a, a way to kind of corral and maneuver and effectively bring together the Marxist movement of Russia in order to win. That's really what it was. So in 1903, many of the great revolutionaries in Russia met in London. They met in London. They were Russian revolutionaries, and they had a meeting in London. And this meeting took place in London. And Stalin, I think Stalin was there. Bukharin was there. Zinoviev was there. Kamenev, Trotsky, all of them were there. And Lenin, at this meeting, he pitched to them his idea for a party of new type. A party of new type. He said, if we're going to win, if we're going to effectively overthrow capitalism, overthrow the czar, we have to have a new method, a new style of organizing. We need to build a party of new type. And before this meeting happened, he wrote a, of a short essay pitching it called Where to Begin, and then he wrote a full-length book pitching it called What is to be Done. Um, and, and if you read What is to be Done, he actually, the name What is to be Done, it was the name of a popular science fiction novel at the time. There was a science fiction novel in Russia. I think it's about a guy who like builds a little civilization in his house or something. It's a weird sci-fi novel. It was really popular at the time. So he took the name of this popular sci-fi novel and he wrote a, a, a political essay, basically, called What is to be Done, with the same name as the sci-fi novel, to convince people to build a party of new type. And if you read What is to be Done, it is a scathing polemic. Um, he's very worked up, and he's basically saying that if we are going to win, in order to win, we have to change the way that we're organizing. And, and the best advice I ever got, by the way, the best advice anybody ever gave me is they told me to read What is to be Done backwards. The book What is to be Done by Vladimir Lenin is a very, very difficult book to read, right? Keep its members principled. Keep members principled. Question mark. Keep um, deviating. It was actually very good advice. What is to be done? It's written, it's written like this. He talks, he starts out with a very, very specific argument, the concept of freedom of criticism. And then from there, he expands to the question of bowing to spontaneity. And from there, he expands the question of, of terror. And, and the final section is he goes over the entire history of the Russian revolutionary movement. So the thing is, when you're reading the book well over a hundred years later, 
in another country, in another language, starting with this very specific argument and expanding outward is not a good way to start. So if you really want to get a lot out of the book, What is to be Done by Lenin, the best advice I ever got is to start at the end. Start at the end. Start with the final chapter. And then read the previous chapter. And then read the previous chapter. And then read the previous chapter. And then read the first chapter. That's the best way to read it. That way you get the message of the book. Because when it starts out, I'll tell you, the first time I ever read What is to be Done, very funny story. So I was, I was, I think I was in junior high, right? I wasn't even in high school yet. And I was reading the encyclopedia entry about Lenin. And it said, and then in 1903, Lenin wrote his very, very, very important book, What is to be Done? And I thought, wow, what a name, What is to be Done? And I thought this was some kind of agitational pamphlet about how to overthrow the czar or something like that. So I went, I think I went to the library and I ordered a copy of What is to be Done? And I started reading it, and my head, I had no clue what they were talking about. Raboche, DeLeo, and, and he's ranting against this concept of freedom of criticism. I'm like, what is freedom of criticism? Shouldn't be people, is he against freedom of speech? Does he think people shouldn't be able to free to criticize? What? I had no idea what he was talking about. And it took me years before I reopened what is to be done by Lennon, because I couldn't make heads or tails of it. So many references to newspapers in with Russian names that I had never heard of. Uh, so many references to people like Kautsky or Bernstein I, I, I'd never heard of. References to this, the, the, the Second International, which I'd never, I had no idea what he was talking about. Um, I didn't reopen what is to be done until I was 19, until I was doing communist political activism. And the group I was associating with at the time was trying to convince me that we needed to have a campaign to impeach President George W. Bush. Uh, and I, I didn't understand why that was necessary. So they said, oh, well, you got to read what is to be done. So I remember I went and read what is to be done. And I read it with them. And I, reading it in a group, it was a class. I didn't just read it on my own, but I read it with four or five other communists. Um, and that was a huge, a huge uh, eye-opening experience for me. And they had a political party called the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, the RSDLP. And the RSDLP was a pretty loose association of people. Um, you know, uh, it was a loose association. The RSDLP uh, was a loose association of people who basically, they all agreed with a general set of principles. They believed in Marxism. So they formed this party, party, the RSDLP, the party of the old type. And the RSDLP, um, it didn't have an official newspaper. Um, its newspapers, its press were private. M members of the group happened to own newspapers that they published Marxist views in it. But there was no official party newspaper. Um, and they believed in Marxism. And generally what the RSDLP did is it bowed to spontaneity or it engaged in tailism. And what that meant was that uh, if there was a, a strike someplace, if there was an uprising, if there was a spontaneous revolt uh, in, in Russian society, the RSDLP, the RSDLP would go running, the members of the RSDLP would go running to wherever it was and shout, oh, we agree with you, and, you know, there you go. And all kinds of rebellions and uprisings would happen, and the RSDLP uh, and the, you know, the, the, not, the, the Marxists of Russia, they would just go chasing after it. They would tail after it. They would engage in tailism or bowing to spontaneous. Something spontaneous would happen, and they would run behind it going, wow, yeah, that's great, you know. And uh, generally, um, this didn't really change things very much. And the slogan that the RSDLP used to justify doing this is they said, we are lending the economic struggle a political character, meaning that there was a strike, a group of workers, um, you know, um, you know, a group of workers went on strike, um, they went on strike, uh, and uh, they would, they would, 
you know, they would, uh, they, would, they would run behind it and say, hey, we're a political party, the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party, and we support your strike. So you're engaged in an economic struggle for higher wages, and we are showing up, and we are telling you that we're a political party that agrees with you. So we're lending the economic struggle a political character. That was their, their argument about why what they were doing was effective. And Vladimir Lenin said, this is not, doesn't matter, right? This, these protests, these rebellions, they happen anyway. They happen anyway, um, whether you're there or not. Um, but you just run behind them and you know you bow to spontaneity you just kind of whatever spontaneously happens anyway you support it um and then you run behind it announcing that oh you're a political party and you support it that's not what needs to be done lenin argues that they instead need to form a vanguard party a party of new type and that this party will engage in agitation and propaganda and that whenever there's a spontaneous rebellion among the masses that this party will be like a bellows, right? You know, it's like when there's a, a little, little fire, they'll blow air on it and make the fire even bigger. And they'll, they'll, you know, they'll make the confrontation or the conflagration in society bigger. You know, they'll make it bigger by agitating. And they will go to, go to the rebellion, go to the strike, go to the protest, and they will engage in agitation and they will stir people up to engage in greater confrontation. And they will try to direct this spontaneous uprising away from supporting the old power structure and away from just kind of fading out. And they'll try to blow it up into a confrontation with the system. That what generally happens when there's a spontaneous uprising in society is that it will generally get usurped by sections of the power structure. And that energy from the spontaneous rebellion will get pushed into supporting one figure or another within the old order. And the job of the Bolsheviks was to go where, where some kind of rebellion took place, go to where the confrontation was happening, and blow it up bigger and direct it against the entire system, not in support of one figure or another within the old power structure, not with agitation. And while they were engaging in agitation and making these confrontations bigger, they should also be picking out the most advanced, the people that were the most effective organizers and leaders of these protests and rebellions, picking out the most advanced and propagating to them. So you agitate to the masses to make confrontations bigger, and you propagate to the advanced, to the people that are the, the leaders of the masses, the people leading the strikes, the people leading the protests. You find them, and when you meet them, you teach them communism. You teach them Marxism. You propagate to them. You agitate to the masses. That was the Bolshevik method. And that the Bolshevik party would engage in democratic centralism. In order to make a decision as a group, there would be a broad discussion in the group. But once, through the democratic process, they had determined what they were going to do, then it was the obligation of every member to carry it out, whether you agreed or not. And this is something that a lot of activist groups have struggled with. There's a disagreement in the group about what to do. Not everyone agrees. So after a decision is reached, they vote, we're going to do this. Well, you know, the people who voted to do it, they do it. And the people who voted no, they say, well, okay, well, the group can do this, but I'm not doing it. And the idea was, no, they needed to function more like an army. They need to have more military-style organizing. So after the group decides we're going to march down the street, they might take a vote. And, you know, 75% march down the street, but the vote is, you know, 25% no, 75% yes. However... If the majority, if they decide they're going to march down the street, 100% has to march down the street. If, if, if the whole group decides we're going to march down the street, we all march. Every member is obligated to carry out the decisions. And the idea for the party of new type was that it was a method to get all these very effective, well-known revolutionary organizers in Russia, Bukharin, Zinoviev, Trotsky, Stalin, all of them into one organization, combining their efforts, 
so it would be more effective. That was the idea. And at this meeting in London, Lenin pitched his idea for a party of new type. And he said, if we're going to win, we need to combine our efforts and we need to form a central committee. And all of you can be part of the central committee. And we'll be the central committee of this Bolshevik party. And that way we'll combine all of our efforts. When we decide we're going to do something, we'll all do it. We'll all throw all of our energy into it. And that can be how we ultimately set up and achieve a socialist revolution. That was the idea of the party of new type. Um, and the majority of the people in the room voted to join it. And the minority of the people in the room voted not to join it. The majority of the people in the room, they became the Bolsheviks. That's the majority group. That's what Bolshevik means. It means majority group. The people in the room who didn't decide to join it, they became the minority group, and they became the Mensheviks, and they remained the party of the old type. And Trotsky voted against it, but Trotsky had the idea that he was going to go halfway. Trotsky's idea was that he was going to form something called the August Bloc, and he was going to get the Bolsheviks to stay in the same party as the Mensheviks, but form a more radical faction, the August Bloc. Um, and Lenin said no. He said, we're going to have to form our own organization. If we're going to function in a disciplined manner, if we're going to move toward actually taking power, we've got to break it off with the, with the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party. We have to form our own organization. We need to have one newspaper to represent our views. We need to have one face to the masses. Even if we disagree internally, we have to have one message that goes out to the masses. Um, you know, so no, no, we're not going to. We're not going to... Uh, we're not going to, to do that. Um, you know, uh, we're not going to join the Mensheviks and be the radical faction within this old organization. We're going to form our new group. Well, Trotsky tried to form the August Bloc, and the August Bloc failed miserably. Nobody showed up. It was a complete and utter failure. Um, and, you know, Trotsky, for a while, he had his own grouping within the Mensheviks, and then he had his own whatever. And Trotsky, you know, he moved on. He had his own little following, you know, around Trotsky, but it, it didn't work out. So that's, and it was that understanding that you needed to form a party of a new type, of people who gave the whole of their lives to be the tribune of the people, a vanguard party, a party of new type, this new, more effective way of organizing, that is what Lenin's brilliance was. And this party of new type that he formed, this vanguard party um, that, he, that he created, um, it was very difficult to keep it together. And when I talk about Lenin being nervous and stressed out, a lot of what he was doing was trying to keep this organization of all kinds of people who did not agree with each other, had vehemently different personal views, political views, was trying to keep them all in the same group trying to keep them all in the same organization, trying to keep them in his party of new type. That's, that, is what, that is what Lenin was, was known for. Lenin was not a mass organizer as much as he was an organizer's organizer. He organized organizers. He agitated agitators. He corralled revolutionaries together. That's what he did, and it caused him a huge amount of stress, and he built an organization in which all these great revolutionary thinkers and organizers in Russia could coordinate their activities. And that's what you need to understand about Vladimir Lenin. That's Lenin, okay? That is who Vladimir Lenin was. And, you know, the mausoleum that was built after Lenin died, that, was, that served a political purpose. The cult of Lenin, you know, Leninism, that all served a political purpose because... You know, the Soviet Union had been a feudal society. The Russian Empire had been one of the most conservative and traditional societies in history. Uh, and after, after the overthrow of the Tsar, uh, you had a deeply conservative population, um, but you also had the radical left-wing ideas of the Bolshevik leaders, and there was a contradiction there. And so by putting Lenin in a mausoleum, Right? By, by putting his face everywhere. This was something people could understand. It mimicked a lot of the Russian Orthodox traditions. In the Russian Orthodox Church, it was, uh, it was believed that the body of saints, the way to determine if someone was a saint, uh, was if their body uh, did not decompose uh, at the same rate that other people's bodies decompose. So putting Lenin in the mausoleum, you know, preserving his body and putting it on display, was kind of a subtle way 
And they didn't directly say it, but it was kind of a subtle way of saying that Lenin is a saint and putting Lenin's face everywhere, right? And, and you know, having an image of Lenin where he almost practically has a halo on his head. I mean, not exactly. I mean, it was, it was a mimicking of some of the Russian Orthodox traditions. Lenin became the iconic figure of the new, of, of the new Soviet society. Um, and that's, you know, that is, it was necessary to do. And so the understanding of, of the Bolshevik party as Lenin's little cult and all that, that was necessary. It made a political, it served a political purpose. But the thing is that in reality, if you look at the history of the Bolshevik party, Lenin was constantly getting outvoted. Did you know this? Many times, Lenin would want the Bolsheviks to do something, and the rest of the Central Committee, Bukharin, Zinoviev, Kamenev, Litvinov, Stalin, would vote no. Many times, many, many times, Lenin would be furious. He was, he was always fighting, always fighting with the, the rest of his Central Committee. You know, it always. I mean, you read the letters, read the letters. You can get the complete works of Lenin. You know, they have this big thing. Read the letters section. He is constantly angry, yelling at them. He's threatened. He threatens to quit at numerous times. He said, I will resign from this party. If he, he, They were fighting with each other up and down and backwards and forwards. And Lenin often did not get his way. Many times, Vladimir Lenin, the guy who thought of the whole thing, the guy who created the whole group, got outvoted. So this, this notion that, that Lenin, that it, that it was a cult around Lenin, that it was Lenin's great personality, this, this cult of personality centered around the great Vladimir Lenin, that's, that's, that's historical fiction, right? It's a fiction that made sense. It made sense. Um, made a lot of sense. But... It, 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 it wasn't true, right? And that, that who Lenin was is quite interesting. 